Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning, and glad you could join us, and it's a glorious day in Melbourne. And in God, it's a glorious day every day, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he's given us this day, and this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice, hallelujah, we will rejoice. And you know, God's called us and chosen us to be part of what he's doing in the earth and what a glorious and wonderful privilege that is. And we were born for such an hour as this. And you know, the patriarchs before us, all those saints that have gone before us, they would have loved to have been in this day. Yes, they had to do what they had to do in their season, willingly and obediently. And, uh, and yet we have the privilege of being born in this season. And this is going to be God's greatest hour in the earth, what he's going to do before Jesus returns. And so it's going to take all of us working together and bringing in the harvest and being all about our father's work isn't it hallelujah jesus said i must be about my father's will and what's his will it's his word hallelujah and so we're to be about our father's will and being all that god would have us to be and everyone said amen hallelujah now firstly i'd like to um what i'd like to talk about today is called i've called it god's building god's building and in scripture there are many names for God's building. In some places, it's called the temple of God, God's building, his church, his house, holy temple, his body, a spiritual house, a habitation of God, his vine and branches, and the holy city in New Jerusalem. So that's very comprehensive, isn't it? And yet it's all throughout his Bible and what God's going to do in the earth and what he is doing. And as a foundation, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I'm opening King James Bible here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And we read here and it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, which is teaching, instruction, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And reading verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hallelujah. And I'll read it from the Amplified. Every scripture is God breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error, and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, for holy living in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose and action. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we learn from this scripture that all scripture is profitable. It's to our advantage. And all scripture, of course, is the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's both. And when we understand both, it gives us a balanced understanding of God who he is and gives us understanding of the word because what's hidden in the old testament is revealed in the new and overcomers get to understand the hidden manner it's in the old testament hallelujah and so what we learn from the old testament helps us understand what the lord desires to do as shown in the new testament scriptures amen and also we understand that what occurs naturally applies to us spiritually as being part of God's spiritual church that he's building in the earth. Amen. And God has always desired to dwell with his people. That's always been the heart of God. And in the Old Testament, let's just look at a couple of examples. You know, let's turn to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. And we read here in verse 8. And this is what the Lord said. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So this is the Lord saying that make a dwelling place that I may be with you. Hallelujah. And we know from this scripture that that sanctuary speaks about the tabernacle of Moses. So God always wanted to be with his people. And we know from scripture that King David, he desired to build God a dwelling place. And yet, it was to be his son, Solomon, who would build God a dwelling place. 
and that dwelling place was called Solomon's Temple. And we find it in 1 Kings chapter 5. 1 Kings chapter 5. And verse 17 and 18. And we read here. And the king commanded and they brought great stones, costly stones and hewed stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders, he had Hiram to get the stones, did hew them and the stone quarters the stone squares so they prepared timber and stones to build the house timber and stones to build the house and you know the foundation of Solomon's temple required many stones and these foundation stones were large they were expensive and needed a lot of shaping and preparation and to hew something to hew something is to chop it with an axe or a sword to cut it into shape. And so the hewed stones were really large stones that had been prepared and worked on so that when they were brought together, every stone fitted perfectly in their place. Perfectly. And Solomon's temple was so magnificent that people came from all over the nation to see it, including the Queen of Sheba. And what God did naturally, he is going to do spiritually in his church. And his church is going to be glorious. Hallelujah. And Solomon's builders and Aram's builders, they speak of God's ministries who use the word of God, which will is likened to a two-edged sword, which brings adjustment to our lives so that we too will be perfect and fit perfectly in our place in the body of Christ. Amen. And so what does that all mean to us? All right, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 we read here. It says, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. And the Amplified says, for we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. You are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. It's really clear, isn't it? We are God's building. And but we see there firstly we're called laborers and workers together with God. And then secondly, we're called God's building. And this word building in the Greek, actually, it means an architecture or a structure. So we're God's building. We are God's structure. And God's building has foundations and structure. That's verse 10 reading on. And according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So this tells us Paul, who was an apostle, he was a wise master builder. And the words master builder in the Greek, it means a chief constructor or an architect. So here's God's ministry, one of God's ministries as a chief constructor and an architect. And Paul has laid the foundation. He's, he's given us God's word. Hallelujah. And verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So for us individually, the true foundation that is laid in each person's heart, of course, is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. Amen. And God's building is also referred to as a temple of God. And we read in verse 16, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So he's saying we individually and collectively, but individually we are the temple of God. And also Jesus refers to the building as being his church, which is built upon him. Jesus is the rock. And it's shown in Matthew 18, sorry, Matthew 16, verse 18. 
Matthew 16, verse 18. And this is what Jesus says. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, speaking of himself, Jesus Christ, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail. So no matter what the enemy tries to do, whatever his plans are, whatever his agenda is, they're not going to overcome God's church. It shall stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And just and Jesus likens the building to a house and which again must be built on the rock so it will stand. All right? The building has to be built on the rock so it will stand. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 7 and then verse 24 to 27 and it says, Jesus saying this, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came. And the wind blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So we understand a natural house with all this opposition but we are speaking of God's spiritual house. And you know, the rain speaks of the word of God. It's going to test every house. It's going to test every foundation. Floods is a double portion of the word of God. Hallelujah. And winds can speak of winds of doctrine. And so we're going to hear things and we're going to experience things in our walk with the Lord. And it's going to test our foundation, our very essence, where we are in God, what our future is in God. But it's going to, they're going to just test everything. And, uh, and God's going to allow that, right? And he wants us to pass every test. Hallelujah. 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 And so every life is going to be tested by adversary. And, and we may be, we need to be sure that our confidence and our strength is in the rock, Jesus Christ, and not in money or relationships or materialism. Or anything that the world has to offer. Because only Jesus Christ endures for everything. Endures forever. Everything else is going to pass away. He's coming back in flaming fire. So we just need to keep things in perspective. And uh, our confidence and strength and trust needs to be in the rock. Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the main foundation support for this building that he's doing in the earth. And we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, let's turn to it. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Hallelujah. And verse 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom groweth sorry verse 22 in whom you are builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit let me just read that from the amplified verses 21 and 22 in him the whole structure is joined bound welded together harmoniously and it continues to rise grow increase into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated and sacred to the presence of the Lord. Verse 22, in him and in fellowship with one another, you yourselves are being built up into this structure with the rest to form a fixed abode, which is a dwelling place of God in and by through the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> And he chose us, each one. I mean, it's, it's just very wonderful. And for this building to be growing, it grows, it means it's alive. And the rock, of course, Jesus Christ, he's alive. And the foundation, the apostles of prophets, they're alive because Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 32, I'll read it. 
I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So even though those original apostles and prophets are not here, they're alive in heaven, but the word of God endures forever. Hallelujah. It's a living book. Hallelujah. For every generation and particularly this generation. So scripture tells us that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. And we read here, And you also as lively or living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And the Amplified says, come and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that word to be built up in the Greek, it means to construct, to build up a house builder and to embolden, to edify. So God's building has an order of construction and within the building, every stone has its part to play, supporting each other. You don't build a building with just one brick or one stone. It's many membered, hallelujah. It's many membered yet one body. Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16. And we read here, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Hallelujah. So these living stones that we just read about are God's people and they're being compacted together. That's you and I being compacted together. And the word compact, it means to unite, to knit together, to join, to press firmly together. Now, we might think, well, I live, well, for me, I live in Australia. We live in Australia, but other people live in overseas nations and countries. But what God is doing, it's one heart. We will be as one. We're in different nations, of course, but God is bringing in a unity through his word that's going to bring such a unity in the body of Christ. It won't matter what country you're in. We will all be on the same page as that expression goes. Hallelujah. There'll be such a unity. Praise God. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So this body, 6 verse 19, it says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which, you, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own. So in the natural, individually, we are a body, literally, right? Which is being transformed according to Romans. I'll turn to it, Romans chapter 12. And we read in 1 to 3, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. 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 And just like our natural body has many different parts, some are seen and some are unseen, so does God's body in his church. Like some are ministries out in front, but some are working in behind the scenes, you know. And so, but everybody has a particular part in this structure, in this body that God's producing. And verse four, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. And the Amplified says, for as in one physical body, we have many parts, organs, members, and all these parts do not have the same function or use. So we can understand that, can't we? You know, my heart, internal heart has a purpose to do. 
different to what my fingers do. Hallelujah. And verse 5, it says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every member, every one, members one of another. And the Amplified says, So we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ, the Messiah. And individually, we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on one another. Hallelujah. 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 And, you know, as individual members, we each have unique gifts and need to demonstrate, walk the walk, have a, a lifestyle that reflects God. And although we are all members of God's body, we do all have different giftings. And let's read on verse 6, Romans 12, verse 6. It says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy, mercy with cheerfulness. Mm, hallelujah. And reading on. Let love be without dissimulation. That means uh, always be sincere, always be real. All right. Not hypocrisy, real. Okay. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another. With brotherly love, in honour, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. And I'm just going to read some of that just from the Amplified, just uh, from verse 14. Actually, I'll just keep reading here. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in thy own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but neither give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is to be our lifestyle in the Lord. But I was just going to read that last bit from in the Amplified from verse 14. And you know, let the word of God just speak to our hearts that it can take root in us. Hallelujah. Be written in our hearts. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy. And weep with those who weep, sharing others' grief. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish or high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and give yourselves to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath. 
For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, you will help, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not let yourselves be overcome by evil, but overcome master evil with good. Hallelujah. That's our, that's the way of life. That's the way of God. And may we all ask the Lord to continue to help us to walk the walk, to live that life. Hallelujah. All right. In this body, which we are all members of, there's only one head. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And we read here. And he is the head of the body, the church. So that's really clear, isn't it? He is the head. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And the Amplified says, he also is the head of his body, the church, seeing he is the beginning the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first and be preeminent. Hallelujah. He's the head. He's the head. And as I said, we are members of his body and his body is throughout the whole world. And we read, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What else we read about the body here? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 17, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The hand is not the foot. The eye is not the ear. we just got to be who we are individually. Whatever God's called us to do, that's what we need to do. We don't have to be something we're not. We just have to be who God's created us to be. Let's read on. Verse 18, but now has God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, upon these we bestow more abundant honour, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the whole body together, having given more abundant honour to that part which lacketh, that there should be no schism in the body, and that the members should have the same care one for another and whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it or if one member be honored all the members rejoice with it hallelujah and verse 27 now you are the body of christ and members in particular hallelujah and just uh, reading on 28 and god has set some in the church first apostles secondarily prophets 
thirdly teaches after that miracles then gifts of healing healings helps governments diversities of tongues hallelujah so this order that god sets up it's his structure he's putting all the pieces together where they need to be what they need to be doing he's the builder the scripture says in i think psalm 127 except the lord build the house they labor in vain we each need to be doing what god would have us to do nothing more nothing less just what god would have us to do hallelujah and we said at the beginning that god's building his structure is also likened to vine and branches and in the book of john we read let's turn to john 15 and we read here that the vine speaking of jesus He's the one who gives supply to the branches, the believers, the church, so that they can live. Hallelujah. We can't do it without him. In fact, he says without him, we can do nothing. So let's read John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, I, this is Jesus speaking, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. That means he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's really clear, isn't it? Without Jesus, we can do nothing. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So to remain in God's love and body, we need to continue to abide in him. And that word abide, it actually does mean to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be present, to remain and to stand. Hallelujah. And who are we to abide in? Jesus, the vine. And who is Jesus? Jesus is God, the word. So we're to abide, continue, dwell, endure, remain and stand in the word. Amen. Amen. And another very important part of this structure is communion. Without communion, Jesus said we have no life. And we, re we just read in John 15 that it's the vine that supplies the life and Jesus is the vine, the supplier of the life of whom the building grows. Hallelujah. And so let's read John chapter 6, verse 53. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And the communion bread or the biscuit symbolically represents Jesus' body. And the communion drink symbolically represents Jesus' blood. And both taken by faith give life to those who believe when taking it. Hallelujah. And, you know, the, the, the biscuit, the bread reminds us of by his stripes we are healed. So by faith we can receive healing in when we take communion. And the juice reminds us of his shed blood, which continues to cleanse us from all sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we are instructed by Jesus to do this. Hallelujah. 
And unless we do it, we have no life. And so we need to be gathering more and more to have communion. Hallelujah. Not less. Hallelujah. And we need to be living branches, living branches. Hallelujah. 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 And it just goes on further to say, let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it says there, it talks about the fullness of the end time churches. And they're instructed by the Lord. They're, they're commended for what they do well. And five of those churches are told to repent. But within that seven churches is the fullness of the end time church. And we do read warnings in these chapters as well. And so we can't just think, oh, it'll be all fine and no problems. You know, no, we need to continue on in God and remain in God and continue to press in. And we just read in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And it says about the church of Ephesus, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works. And thy labor and thy patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and they are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat thing against you because you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remember thy and will remove thy candlestick out of his place unless thou repent. But this thou has that thou hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also do hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right. The Greek words for that word, first love, you've left your first love. It's actually proteus agape. And that actually means first love feast. And our love feast is Jesus Christ, our communion. That's our love feast. And we read, let's turn back to Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. We read what Jesus says. Luke 22 verses 19 to 20. It says, and he, speaking of Jesus, took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Right? We are commended and commanded by Jesus to do this in remembrance. You know, remember the children of Israel, God delivered them mightily from Egypt. They got out into the wilderness and then they forgot God. And so here's Jesus instituting communion so we never, ever forget. We will always remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us. And it brings us back to him every time we have it. And we should be having it regularly, at least once a week. Always remembering, even daily we should remember him, of course. But communion, it says, um, Acts 20 verse 7, I think, it, they, they met together and broke bread on the first day of the week. So we need to keep having communion. And this church... This, uh, that Jesus spoke about the church at Ephesus, he, the Lord said, if they did not return to their first love, their love feast, he would remove their candlestick. And a candlestick, it was a, a if you've ever seen a candlestick, and it's a branch, there are branches on the candlestick. He would remove their branch, remove their candlestick. And we just read in John 15, 6, if a man abide not in me, his course cast forth as a branch. And with it, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. We do not want our branch removed. We do not want to be separated. And if the branch is separated, that means there's no fruit is produced. 
And if there's no fruit, there's no light to find the way to the door to the wedding feast. And if the branch is disconnected, it gets thrown in the fire. So what a warning. What a warning. We need to be remaining in him, pressing in, taking communion, uh, walking in love, living that lifestyle as we read earlier. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is God's will for us. He's not scolding us. He's, he's encouraging us. He's instructing us in his right ways. Hallelujah. Because he wants the best for every life. He, and he certainly, he's paid the price for his glorious church that he's producing, bringing together in the body, in the, in the earth today. Hallelujah. And again, there's one body in Christ. And although we live all over the world, we have been called to be part of it. And let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And we read here, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. That means making allowances for one another. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. And one spirit, even as you are called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Hallelujah. One faith, one word, one Lord, one God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And just where did, he, where did he descend? His body went into the sepulchre, didn't it? Hallelujah. So we've been called out of darkness to walk in God's light. We've been called to be into this one body. Hallelujah. And just reading on, it says here, verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. There's the fivefold ministry. For the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together is compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So it's increasing. That means it's alive. But did you see that where it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith? Because we read earlier, in verse 5, one faith. So it's God's ministries using the word of God that's going to bring about a unity that we all actually do believe the same thing. What separates people at the moment is doctrine and yet God's true ministries are going to blow a trumpet, bring a word that will bring everybody into God's understanding. We have the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and through God's ministries, those fivefold ministries, God is going to bring about a unity that's never, ever happened in, in the history of the church. But God's going to do it because he said he's going to. Hallelujah. And God can't lie. So I choose to believe God's word. If he said he could do it, he's going to do it. For me and my house, I just want to be part of it. Hallelujah. So praise God. And I just would like to read verses um, 
verses 11 to 16, just out of the Amplified. It just says here, and it just opens it up. And his gifts were varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of the flock and teachers. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints. He's consecrated people that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church. That it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith. There you are. And in the comp comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, that we might arrive at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in him. So then we may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every change changing wind of doctrine, the prey of cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery in inventing errors to mislead. Rather, let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. Enfolded in love, let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. For because of him, the whole body, the church in all its various parts, closely joined and firmly knit together by the joints and ligaments with which it's, it is supplied, when each part with power adapted to its need is working properly in all its functions, grows to full maturity, building itself up in love as i said before <laughs> this is what god's doing this is what god's doing we can't do it in our own strength all we can do it individually is to yield ourselves offer ourselves a living sacrifice because this is what god's doing and this is god's plan and he's going to do it he is going to do it he's going to produce this oneness in the body and it's going to be very wonderful all right the last section about the the body is um, God's final building which is the finish it's called the city of God and it's coming down out of heaven and it's as a city it's called the new Jerusalem and this city will be on the new earth with a new heaven because the current earth and heaven according to the word of God will pass away let's read it Revelation 21 Revelation 21 Verses 1 to 5. And it, this is John saying, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for all these words are true and faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's word is true. God's going to do it. And this is what he's going to do. Hallelujah. And God, this city, it actually has foundation stones. So I was just thinking that as I said that, you know, behold the tabernacle. Remember right at the back beginning, we said about, he said to Moses, make a dwelling place, a sanctuary where I may dwell. And here he is right in Revelation at the end of the book saying he's building it, he's doing it, and it's, got, it's getting done. And, and because Revelation talks about what's future. And so here it is, it's going to be done. Hallelujah. 
And this city, just like Solomon's temple, had foundations. Let's turn to Revelation 21, where we are in verses 10 to 14. And it says here, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. So this building, it's called a city. The holy Jerusalem. So it's holy. It's, there's holiness. There's no nothing unclean there. And descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so it has foundations, and it's the names of the first 12 apostles of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And then verse 15, it says, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. The golden reed speaks of the word of God. And individually as living stones in the wall, we are being measured. And just down in verse uh, 23, 27, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever makes an ab work of abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in this city, there are not going to, there's going to be no liars or those that do anything, any kind of defiling. And that includes idolatry, sorcery, whoremongers, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, thieves, covetous, revilers, and all unsaved, all ungodly people. Those people will not be given access to this glorious city. Only those whose names are in the Lamb's book of life will be in this city. And the question, is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Today is the day of salvation. So now is the time to call out to the Lord and repent and ask him to forgive and receive, forgive you and receive his mercy. Hallelujah. And if and I, I would encourage you, if that's you, you know, just like Ephesus, repent, repent and turn back to the Lord. Now is the time. You may have never been saved. Today's a good day to give your life to the Lord. Or if you've strayed away from God, today's a very good day to come back to the Lord. Now is the time. And we only have today. We don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. So we must take each day as it comes. And we have today and every day we need to be in that right place with the Lord walking with him, abiding with him, living in him, loving him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So now's the time to call out to him, receive his mercy and grace. Amen. And meanwhile, even though, you know, we are met many members in particular, you and I have been called to be part of God's building, God's city. And what a wonderful privilege. So in summary, may each one of us you know, press in and measure up and be all that God would has called us to be, to be part of God's building, and it'll be all for his glory. And everyone said, Amen.